Hello, I'm Patricia Trowine, an audiologist with Cochlear. And on behalf of everyone at Cochlear, I'd like to welcome you to this year's research symposium as part of the HLAA Experience Online. I'd like to send a special thank you to Barbara Kelly and the entire HLAA team for bringing this year's conference to you in a virtual environment. Research has always been important to us at Cochlear. It began with our founding father, Professor Clark. Professor Clark was inspired to grow up to fix ears after watching his own father suffer from progressive hearing loss. As a result of his research science dedication and resilience, we saw the FDA approval of the first multi-channel cochlear implant. And today, hearing implants help over half a million people around the world to hear better and lead full and connected lives. Cochlear continues our investment in R&D, including in the partnerships with academic institutions. Today's research symposium's focus is on tinnitus. Tinnitus impacts millions of Americans, and whether it exists with or without hearing loss, tinnitus can have disabling effects that impact one's quality of life. The scientists on this panel today are here to share with you their clinical expertise and research on the origins as well as the latest treatments for tinnitus. Today's panel will be moderated by Dr. Kelly Tremblay. Dr. Tremblay is a clinician, professor, and researcher who's dedicated to her life to supporting hearing loss and the community, especially with her activity on the HLAA board. Thank you, Dr. Tremblay. I'll turn it over to you, and I hope you all enjoy this year's research symposium. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Kelly Tremblay. I'm a board trustee of the Hearing Loss Association of America, and I personally would like to welcome you to our research symposium today and bring you the latest information on tinnitus research and management. I'm here to host this session, but I really want to welcome you on behalf of my fellow board members, as well as the staff and leadership of, of Hearing Loss Association of America in general. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge funding from Cochlear Corporation, as well as through a grant that allows us to hold this event that was granted from the National Institutes of Health, the division of NIDCD for making this event possible. And a special out, a shout out to Dr. Jan Bluestein for her efforts in writing that grant and, and um, scheduling the event today. So today you'll hear from three presenters, all experienced and experts in the field of tinnitus. Some of them are clinical providers that have worked with patients and, and clients firsthand, and some who will bring our, their research from the laboratory to you today. I think that you'll find their presentations very thought-provoking, and I'm sure you'll have questions um, afterwards. And so I want to let you know that we will reserve questions till after all three presentations are complete. And these scientists and clinicians will be available to you for a real time exchange of question and answers. So please hang around and uh, stay, stay online for that question and answer period. To set us in, to start us off, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Dr. Colleen Laprell, who is a scientist professor um, at the University of Texas, Dallas. She will share her slides with you in a minute to tell you more about herself, her background and her position. And I'll turn it over to you, Colleen. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate the invitation to come and talk with the group today about the important problem of tinnitus and in particular, the problem of noise-induced tinnitus, which is a major challenge for a lot of individuals. Before I begin, I would like to just thank the various groups who have funded our work. Right now, we're receiving funding from the Department of Defense for some of our work related to um, noise-induced injury to the auditory system. Um, NIH has been generous in funding both clinical trials and other data collection uh, for us in the past. We're also working with 3M with some different hearing protection technologies and we have also been funded by uh, several pharmaceutical companies for some work with different agents that may have protective benefits for um, preventing hearing loss, we hope, one day. Um, in addition, I always like to acknowledge that I'm a co-inventor on a couple of patents that are owned by the University of Michigan, and those were for the development of a dietary supplement. 
like to start by just talking with you very briefly about what tinnitus is. Uh, many of you have probably experienced a, a sensation of sound, a sensation of ringing, a whistling, um, maybe some sort of chirping or pulsing or other kind of sound, but something that you hear even though there is nothing in the external environment that is creating that sound. It's being internally generated. And tinnitus is a, a symptom of an injury to the ear or some sort of disease that damages the ear. There are a lot of different potential causes of tinnitus, which is one of the things that has made the development of drug strategies so tr tremendously difficult. It's given the number of different things that can cause um, that symptom, that that perception of ringing, it's very hard to come up with a, a single drug or a single treatment that will ameliorate, um, reduce all of the different injuries that lead to tinnitus. Um, but we also know that in many cases, there is a, a known cause for the ringing in someone's ears, and that's noise exposure. Noise exposure is one of the most common causes for the sensation of tinnitus. Um, many, if not most, adults will experience at least a brief tinnitus at some point in their in their life. About 10% of the adult population is going to go on to develop a chronic tinnitus, and this is a tinnitus that lasts. Um, something that is present for not just minutes, but potentially um, days or weeks or months, and that can be tremendously um, debilitating for many. It can be annoying for some, debilitating for others. Uh, that chronic tinnitus, there's approximately 20 million Americans who experience chronic tinnitus. About 2 million will suffer from extreme and debilitating cases. A lot of the data that we have on the um, the prevalence of tinnitus comes from very large studies that are run by the CDC. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey is one of the largest. The NHANES study surveys approximately 20,000 people every two years, and they collect data on an ongoing basis with those very large cohorts um, sampled every two-year cycle so that they're able to look at the changes in the prevalence of different diseases, different disorders, different conditions. Tinnitus is one of the things that they collect data on. Uh, they also collect data on hearing loss and other health issues such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, blindness. Um, they collect nutritional data. So it's a, it's a tr tremendous extensive health battery which allows the connection of um, different environmental risk factors to the different disease or injury conditions. In addition to the data from the United States, from those large CDC studies, there are data that are collected in a host of other countries. Um, if you were to look at the, the prevalence of tinnitus in Europe or Africa, in Asia or South America, you would find that the, the numbers are very, very similar with respect to about 10% of the population developing a, a chronic tinnitus. Now, among patients with tinnitus, some 20 to 40% will have a noise-induced tinnitus. So as I mentioned before, we know that noise exposure is one of the major causes of tinnitus. And so it explains somewhere between a quarter, um, almost up to 50% of the, the various cases of tinnitus that, that are observed. Specifically speaking to the issue of noise-induced tinnitus, if we go back to those large epidemiological data sets, um, somewhere around 10 million U.S. adults, which is about 6% of the population um, under age 70, um, and perhaps as many as 40 million adults, so up to 24%, have a hearing loss in one or both ears, which may have been caused by exposure to loud noise. And so there is also a, a very significant problem with noise exposure that results in tinnitus in addition to noise exposure resulting in tinnitus. When you put those two things together, 
about 35% of patients who have the hearing loss that's due to noise exposure will also have tinnitus. And so the we call those comorbidities, um, hearing loss and tinnitus that, that go together, both resulting from that exposure to noise. And just like other forms of tinnitus that have um, causes related to vascular disorders or other injuries, other issues, uh, tinnitus that is induced by noise exposure can be acute, um, lasting only for short periods, seconds, or perhaps days, um, or it can be chronic, uh, lasting for months to, to years, um, really always always being present for individuals who are affected by, by chronic tinnitus. And again, for some patients, that chronic tinnitus may be something that exists in the background and is not overly disruptive. And for other patients, that chronic tinnitus can be uh, extremely debilitating, inducing anxiety, sleep disorders, um, disruptions to activities of daily living. So the, the reaction to tinnitus has tremendous diversity in addition to the tinnitus experience itself. If we talk for a minute about how noise damages the ear, um, why there would be hearing loss and why there would be tinnitus. I've provided a cartoon for you to try and introduce the idea that that sound exposure, we, we think of sound, as we talk about sound waves as something like ripples on a lake, but the, the reality is that sound waves are pressure driven motion of air molecules. And so when the air molecules are moving a lot because the sound is loud. They're pushing harder on the, the thin, delicate membrane that we call the tympanic membrane. Um, you've probably heard of this called the eardrum, and it is a membrane that sits at the inside of your ear canal. And this is why we always say not to use Q-tips, is because if you put the Q-tip into your ear too far, um, you can damage that, that very thin membrane. So when you have loud sound, the air molecules are, are moving um, with with high pressure against that that thin membrane and they're making that thin membrane vibrate and the vibration of that membrane pushes on those little um, bones that you see sitting behind it. We call those the, the middle ear bones or the middle ear ossicles. And those three bones are connected together and each one has a, a levering action against the next one where it's increasing the pressure that is put on the membrane and resulting in a, in a much larger push, a physical push, um, on what we call the oval window. And the oval window has fluid behind it. The oval window is the opening to the cochlea. And the cochlea has all of the sensory cells sitting inside it. And you can see a blow up of, of what those sensory cells look like. So you see that membrane that is running down the, the middle of the cochlea there. It's got some arrows on the top and the bottom and you see a little wave that's traveling down it. So you have these bones that are that are vibrating and they're pushing on the fluid. And when the fluid is pushed, it pushes that membrane and makes the membrane um, bounce up and down in a particular place based on the, the frequency of the sound. And all of those little hair cells that you see in the in the blow up, um, those rod like structures that have little hairs sitting on top of them. Um, the the membrane that's sitting underneath them bounces up and down and those hair cells get get squished in between um, the membranes and the fluid and they can be damaged and that is the primary cause of hearing loss that occurs after noise exposure is the destruction and damage of those very sensitive delicate cells that are sitting on that membrane now, one of the other things I'd like you to notice on the uh, right hand side of that blow up is you can see some little squiggly lines coming out from underneath um, one of those hair cells and they're traveling to the brain. Those are the nerve fibers that are carrying information to the brain. And there are many, many, many labs that have now shown that those, those nerves 
that are traveling to the brain um, are tremendously vulnerable, that even if the noise exposure doesn't damage the hair cells, doesn't physically tear the, the hair cells apart, that those um, nerve endings that are connected to the cells in the cochlea can be damaged. And it's thought that that disruption of the connections between the brain and the hair cells is one of the leading causes of tinnitus, that it's the, the disconnection of the nerve fibers from the cells in the cochlea that is a, a key cause of tinnitus perceptions, again, whether noise-induced hearing loss develops or not. If we think about this model, I have a, a um, illustration here to show you how that disconnection of the nerve fibers from the cochlea ultimately results in the perception of tinnitus. And so if we start at the top of the, of the figure here, you see that there is excessive noise and there's cochlear injury damage to the hair cells as we were just talking about. And then deafferentation. Deafferentation is the disconnection of those nerves from the cochlea. And it's the loss of those nerves, that deafferentation, that changes the information that's going up to the brain. And so if you think about the normal cochlea um, with normal innervation, you have sound and sound causes the, the hair cells to vibrate and causes the nerves to discharge and that carries information up to the brain that says, hey, um, there's a sound and the brain processes that sound and, and that's how we hear what's happening in the environment. Now, when we have a disconnection, now you have less information that's going to the brain. There's fewer nerves that are responding to sound. There is less excitation going upwards to the brain. And so the brain essentially becomes um, more sensitive. It starts to to discharge on its own, even when there is no sound signal being sent up from the cochlea. And we call that hyperactivity. And when those neurons are more excitable and they're firing, even when there's, when there's no sound that's present, the brain interprets that, that firing as, as if it were sound and creates the sensation of tinnitus. And so that, that disconnection of the cochlea um, from the brain ultimately results in the perception of tinnitus by the changing of the excitability of the brain. I'd like to talk with you a little bit about noise exposure and noise risk. Um, probably everybody has seen something that says, you know, sound levels of 85 dB or above are hazardous. And it's important to recognize what that means when we talk about sound being hazardous. There are a lot of different groups who have tried to understand um, hearing loss that develops with noise exposure. And there are three main agencies which I'll mention right now. One is the International Standards Organization. Another is the Environmental Protection Agency. And the third is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And all three of these different large organizations have used the scientific literature to try and make um, predictions about how many people are at risk for hearing loss as a function of noise exposure um, based on the assumption of eight hours per day of exposure. And so these reporting organizations have been interested in people who work in loud environments and how many people will be at risk for developing hearing loss with their repetitive exposure to noise in the workplace. So what, what you're seeing in this table 
is a, a collection of data for three different sound levels. Um, you have your 90 dB sound levels, which are something like a, a subway, a lawnmower, um, fairly high level sound, sounds that you would have to shout to be heard if you were standing about an arm's length away from someone in those noise backgrounds. And if you look across the different agencies for a worker who is working in those kinds of sound levels eight hours a day throughout their career, um, you can see that somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the population will develop a hearing loss, um, which we're defining as, a, as an elevated threshold at the frequencies that are important for speech understanding. Um, thresholds at 500 hertz, 1 and 2,000 hertz, so fairly low frequency um, hearing loss. Somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of individuals will have hearing loss that interferes with hearing and understanding um, those kinds of quiet speech signals. Now, if we look at 85 dB, which is a sound level that is often referred to as the boundary for hazard, you could think of a smoke alarm that is in a household, maybe a blender, maybe a handsaw. Uh, you can see that somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of people who work in those environments will go on to develop a, a hearing loss um, due to their workplace exposure to noise. Now, if you drop the levels down um, lower to 80 dB, you can, uh, akin to a garbage disposal or perhaps a hairdryer, you can see that the numbers are much smaller. Somewhere between zero and five percent of the population will develop a, a hearing loss if the sound levels are 80 dB for eight hours per day as part of the workplace exposure. So you can see that there is still a, a small subset of people who are at risk for hearing loss, um, even in these lower noise levels than what we often refer to as a, as a boundary for safe. Of course, not everybody is in just 80 or 85 or 90 dB noise exposure. And of course, they don't always work um, for eight hours at a time. And so there's also a lot of information about durations. And so if we were to to conclude that 85 dB is safe for most people, um, remember some 10 to 15 percent will still go on to develop a hearing loss at 85 dBA. Um, then we have to make some assumptions about how much, how much worse is the risk? How many more people will develop hearing loss as the sound levels go up? And so we often talk about hazard doubling when sound levels go up by 3 dB. And that's just based on uh, the physics of sound. Um, with every 3 dB increase, there's a doubling of energy. And so we talk about 3 dB as a, as a doubling of risk. Um, resulting in needing to cut the, the listening time in half in order to be safe. And that's what you see in this table right here. If we start with eight hours, 85 dB as an assumption of safe for most people, then when we go up by 3 dB um, to 88, something like a forklift or a, a prop plane cockpit, the safe time goes down um, by 50%. It drops to four hours. If you go up another 3 dB to 91, it drops to two hours. If you go up to 94 dB, something like a table saw, it gets cut in half to one hour, um, and so on. As you go to higher and higher sound levels, the amount of time that someone would be able to be in those um, noisy conditions would be decreased. And one of the things I just want to highlight for a moment here is a lot of your concerts will be somewhere between 100 and 110 dB. And so there are many, many recreational environments that have the um, potential to be very loud and have people in those environments for um, longer than what would be the recommended safe duration for those particular environments. We'll talk a little bit later about hearing protection. Um, and there's hearing protection that's in spe specifically intended to facilitate um, music listening um, in order to allow people to 
to be safer across environments. If we were to think about how much exposure is safe for everyone, if we wanted to make sure that um, everybody was protected against hearing loss, there's a couple of really good reviews by Rick Neitzel and by Brian Flieger that talk about the prevention of noise-induced hearing loss in adults and children. And if you think back to the tables that we were looking at before, uh, we talked about a 80 dB sound exposure, um, somewhere between 0 and 5% of the no noise exposed population developing a noise induced hearing loss. Um, if we wanted to decrease that number to zero so that nobody was at risk of developing a noise induced hearing loss, then we would have to drop the levels down even lower to 75 um, dBA in order to protect even the most, most vulnerable individuals. Now, that's for hearing loss. Today we're focusing primarily on tinnitus and I have uh, already introduced the idea that tinnitus can be caused by the disconnection of the nerve fibers from the cochlea, which can happen before you have any damage to the hair cells. And so it's really important to remember that we don't have any data that specifically address where the risk for noise-induced tinnitus begins, whether it's the same as for noise-induced hearing loss or um, lower levels. And for both noise exposure and for tinnitus, we don't have any way to identify who the most vulnerable individuals are going to be. And so it's really important that people who are going to be in noisy environments, whether it's occupational or recreational or any other kind of sound exposure with you know, power tools and um, lawnmowers and so on, it's, it's important to have some idea of how to protect your ears so that if you have vulnerable ears, you are not putting them at risk. And so that even if you have less vulnerable ears, you're not putting your, your hearing at risk. So let's talk about safe listening decisions in the real world for a few minutes. I mentioned that at 90 dBA, you you will probably have to shout in order to be heard by someone who's standing at arm's length. If you're standing closer than arm's length, then you have to shout at someone to be heard. Um, I don't know about you, I've been to, to concerts and to clubs where you have to shout almost right into someone's ear to be heard. Um, the sound levels are even higher. And so in those kinds of situations, it's really important to take quiet breaks, to limit the amount of time that you're or in those environments or to wear hearing protection. If during an event your ears start ringing, your ears feel full, um, that is an important warning that your ears are being damaged. Those are symptoms of damage. And so when that happens, it's really important to limit the continued exposure, um, to insert hearing protection, to do something to reduce the current exposure and repeating those exposures can ultimately result in permanent damage. And so if that's the situation you find yourself in on a regular basis, you would want to be proactive in using hearing protection from the beginning to avoid the, the development of those symptoms in the future. Now, there's, there's a recent phenomena where sound level meter apps have become available. And there are literally hundreds of sound level meter apps that are available for the um, iPhone and for Android and other phone platforms. And one of the apps that I, I like to talk a little bit with people about is the NIOSH sound level meter app. Um, it's not meant to replace a professional sound level meter. You couldn't use it in an occupational setting, but it has been shown to be reasonably accurate in several studies that have been done by different, different labs. Um, there is good information from NIOSH about how they developed their app, how they tested their app, and there is also a very nice manual that is helpful for understanding how to use the app and how to interpret the information from the app. I'm going to show you um, what some of that information from the app looks like in just a moment. But first, 
first I would like to remind you that if your if your phone microphone has been damaged, um, the app is using the microphone in order to sample sounds in the environment and in order to generate data about how loud it is. And so if you're using an app and the app says the levels are safe, um, just remember, if your ears are full, if your ears are ringing, um, rely on the the symptoms as a warning that something is too loud. Don't rely on the information from the app um, to suggest that something is safe if your ears are telling you something different. Now, here is um, um, some information about the app. I, I put a a, a screenshot of my um, phone, one of my home screens on here for you, and circled the NIOSH app just so you can see what the symbol looks like when you go into the App Store. As I mentioned, there's lots and lots and lots of noise apps that are out there. Um, when you open the app, you're going to see a, a number of different tabs that give you information. One of the first things to look at is the tab on noise information and there's a host of menus that you can go through. Um, these different menus, they'll give you information about what noises can cause hearing disorders and we use hearing disorders to capture both hearing loss and tinnitus and other things like hyperacusis and oversensitivity, a, a, a sensation of pain in response to sound um, that isn't painful to other people. There is information about how to prevent hearing loss, information about how to um, collect the, the measurements of the sound environment that you're in. We call that a noise survey. And then how to select proper hearing protection devices. So those are all really good pieces of information to use. And then, of course, there's the, the sound level meter tab itself. And this will give you various information. It will give you the ongoing sound in the in the background um, that you're in, you can see that large 82.2 is an instantaneous sound level. Um, the total runtime, how long have you been running the app? Um, various pieces of information that we look at about um, what the the eight hour equivalent sound level would be. So if you if you were exposed for an hour, um, all of our our information about hearing loss is based on eight hour exposures. What is the equivalent exposure if all of that energy you've captured using your app were spread out over eight hours? And of course, then there's a, a predictive tool as well, which tells you based on what the sound exposure is right now and how long you've been measuring it, um, what would your total, do your total dose, your total exposure be if you were to continue to stay in that environment for a total of eight hours? And anything greater than 100% of the daily dose would be considered to be hazardous. So those are some important pieces of information that you can get when you're using the app. Now, if you want to think about how you would go about preventing noise-induced hearing loss and noise-induced tinnitus, I have mentioned a couple of times leaving the environment, um, turning the sound levels down. Hearing protection is the other big one. Um, there's lots of choices for hearing protection out there. Probably all of you have seen the the you know rollable foam earplugs. Um, they're inexpensive. They tend to be handed out free at a lot of different venues where sound exposures are loud. Uh, you have to know how to use them correctly. They require uh, rolling between your fingers to get them into a narrow little cylinder so you can put them um, deeply into the ear canal and then holding them in place until they expand out. Um, and fill the ear canal. If if the majority of that yellow plug is sitting outside of the ear canal, then it hasn't been put in correctly and it's not going to be providing um, as much sound reduction as, as you are hoping it will when you choose to use that product to protect your ears. There are other products. We talk about pre-molded ear plugs. A lot of them have that kind of Christmas tree-like structure um, with the little rubber flanges on them, vinyl flanges, they're made out of different materials. Um, 
some of them have balls on the end. Some of them have the have the flanged shape. There's various um, sizes and styles and many, many options for those. They don't require rolling and that handle can make it easier for some people to put them in um, and out quickly and correctly. There are custom hearing protection options. These require going to visit um, typically an audiologist who will make a, an impression of your ear. They'll um, put impression material into the ear and allow it to harden, send it to the manufacturer, and they will use that mold of your ear to make a, an earplug that is specifically tailored, specifically fit to, to match the, the twists and bends and turns and depth of your ear. Uh, there's also some specialty products, high fidelity earplugs. I mentioned um, earlier in referring to concerts, these have a special filter inside of them that provide a more even attenuation of sound and generally they provide um, less attenuation, less sound reduction than some of your other earplugs that are intended for use in occupational settings. Uh, so that people who want to be hearing and appreciating music are able to enjoy the music and um, hear what what they wanted to hear and just reduce the sound levels enough to uh, make it safe to be in those environments for the, the duration of time that you want to be listening to music. Of course, earmuffs are, are a great option when you're um, mowing the lawn or um, working with some sort of loud power tools. There are also electronic earmuffs and people who enjoy hunting or target practice, electronic earmuffs can be a, a great option because they will allow quiet sounds to be amplified. Uh, there's a little volume knob and so somebody with a little bit of hearing loss can even turn up the sound level inside the earmuffs so that when they're um, walking, they know if they're crunching rocks, breaking sticks, they're able to hear um, somebody who they're, they're moving with and potentially talking quietly or, or whispering with to avoid um, disrupting wildlife around them. But then when there is a discharge of a firearm, um, the, the circuits close and sound is attenuated and they act like a regular earmuff that doesn't allow that loud sound to travel into the earmuff. So there's some really great uh, hearing protection products out there for people who have different hearing needs while they're using hearing protection in different loud environments. So some strategies for preventing noise-induced hearing loss and noise-induced tinnitus. Reducing noise at its source. If you can turn it down, turn it down. Uh, reducing the exposure to the source by decreasing exposure time. If you don't have to be there, if you can leave um, for rest periods. And then choosing the right hearing protection device. Uh, if you're going to be listening to music, consider a high fidelity product. If you're going to be hunting, consider an electronic product. I find the product that that you are able to to happily use so that you'll actually use the earplug when you're in the, the loud environment. And of course, learning to correctly use it, particularly in the case of some of those roll down um, earplugs that are often used incorrectly, making sure that you understand the correct strategies for uh, inserting and using whatever hearing protection product you choose. Now, the last thing that I want to talk with you about today is whether there are drugs or dietary supplements that might be able to be used to protect the ear. We have learned a, a tremendous amount about a, a phenomenon called metabolic stress, um, free radical formation in the ear that can cause hair cells to die and result in uh, hearing loss as well as tinnitus. And there is tremendous interest in um, antioxidant and other drugs and dietary supplements that might prevent this metabolic stress, prevent the hair cell death, preserve hearing, prevent tinnitus. And before I talk about those agents, I just want to 
make sure it's very clear to everyone that there are no FDA approved agents at this time. There is tremendous interest in these strategies. There are companies that are going through clinical trial um, processes, but nothing has been approved by the FDA at this time. And one of the reasons I think it's so important to start with that reminder is because there are a, a number of products that are uh, currently marketed for for protection against noise injury or for um, tinnitus and none of these products have been approved by the FDA for any of those purposes. In terms of testing, this is a table from a, a recent review article. Um, it, it captures a, a snapshot of different clinical trials that are going on right now. There's a website, clinicaltrials.gov, which captures um, all of the clinical trials that are under FDA oversight and that are funded by NIH so that people who are looking for studies to participate in or looking for information about what's being tested can find information. The uh, titles of those studies, the particular agent that is being investigated, the company that is um, completing the testing is, is all listed in this table, and then the status, whether the, the study is completed, whether results have been posted, um, whether the studies are ongoing, um, is, is captured in this table as well. What I think is really exciting and one of the things I hope you'll remember as you take as you leave the the talks today is that clinical development is ongoing for multiple agents and it is absolutely um, possible that one or more of these strategies will be successful. Um, the preclinical data from animal models has been tremendously encouraging and it has led to a tremendous amount of commercial interest. There's a, a great review by Ann Schilder and her team that came out this past year which identified 43 companies that are currently developing drugs for the prevention or treatment of hearing loss or tinnitus. And with respect to our conversations about tinnitus today, 12 of these companies have commercial programs related to the reduction of tinnitus. And it is really encouraging to see the systematic development, the systematic testing, um, through the FDA review process to try and come up with agents that will um, be both safe and effective in preventing hearing loss and tinnitus. So it's an exciting time to see drug development efforts. Uh, I get a lot of questions about um, natural antioxidants given the the emphasis of so many companies on antioxidants and we've done various work with with dietary supplements but certainly the 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 idea that your diet contain can contain a, a large amount of dietary antioxidants if you consume a lot of fruits and vegetables is something that we we and others have been interested in and I want to share this figure with you and walk you through um, some interesting data this is again the NHANES data with the very very large populations and it it's um, a data set where we took the individuals who had provided both information about their dietary quality, the foods that they consume on a, on a daily basis and how much of them, and a hearing test data were available. And so what you're looking at here is uh, the interaction between dietary quality, um, high frequency hearing, since high frequencies are the, the frequencies most commonly affected by noise, and then noise exposure. And so if we look within, if we start by looking at those two black filled circles, these are the less noise exposed um, participants within the population. And you can see that that line is fairly flat. There's there's not a, a very robust relationship between um, between diet, whether you're in the poorest 40% of the dietary group or the best 60% of the dietary group, um, and hearing within that group that doesn't have very much noise exposure, maybe a dB of difference with the the better 
dietary quality being associated with some small um, improvements, some small benefits in hearing. What I want you to look at next is the line that has the two open triangles. And so in this case, what you're seeing is that there's a very dramatic impact of dietary quality on hearing in people with a lot of noise exposure. There is a, a you know, five or six dB difference in threshold sensitivity where you have better hearing in people who have better diets. In other words, the, the, the better diet is able to alleviate some of the hazardous effects of noise um, that would otherwise be expected based on the, the more significant hearing loss in the cohort that has a poor dietary quality. Um, in addition to these relationships between noise and diet and hearing, I also would like to let you know that the, the rate of persistent tinnitus, people who have a, a lasting chronic tinnitus, um, is significantly lower in those with better diets. When you break the population into the, the same bottom 40%, top 60% kind of subsets, you find the prevalence of tinnitus is different um, as a function of dietary quality. So to summarize what we've talked about today, um, noise exposure is a major cause of hearing loss and tinnitus. But both noise-induced hearing loss and noise-induced tinnitus are 100% preventable. If sounds are loud enough that you have to shout, you need to decrease the listening time or wear hearing protection and be sure to wear the right hearing protector, uh, meaning wear one that you are willing and able to wear consistently and correctly for the given sound environment. It, it is possible that there will be pharmaceuticals that prevent noise-induced hearing loss and noise-induced tinnitus, and there's a lot of excitement and, and active effort going towards those goals. But please remember that nothing has been approved by the FDA at this time. And finally, healthy eating has many health benefits. Um, healthier hearing may be one of them, but certainly healthy eating is not going to have um, poor health side effects that dietary supplements with um, high levels of, of unknown ingredients you know, have the, the potential um, to include. So I, I would encourage you to consider healthy eating as part of an overall health behavior strategy, hopefully helping support healthy hearing as well. If you are interested in more information about the topics we've talked about today, there are two great chapters um, that I would point you to, um, one by Brian Allman and his team looking at future pharmacological therapies for tinnitus, another one by Jim Kaltenbach and his team um, looking at why tinnitus occurs. Um, I mentioned the paper by um, Rick Neitzel and Brian Flieger looking at recommendations for recreational sound limits, and then the great new review by Ann Shoulder and her group talking about all of the work that is being done at a, at a commercial level um, and in phase one, phase two, and even phase three um, clinical trials with larger populations to try and um, generate data that will allow drugs to make it through the, the regulatory process and provide benefits. At the end of the session today, there will be time for questions and discussion. And so thank you very much for your attention today. And I look forward to hearing your, your questions and your comments at the end of this session. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I want to thank, uh, thank you again for, for sticking with us. We're moving on to our second speaker in the research symposium on the topic of tinnitus. And I'm really thrilled uh, to introduce Rich Tyler to you. Rich is not only an audiologist, but he's a professor in the School of um, Otolaryngology at the University of Iowa. And for decades, um, Rich has taught audiologists uh, both in the classroom and abroad 
about the clinical ramifications of tinnitus as well as the research implications for that. So I'm thrilled he's here to share that with you. And so I will turn it over to you, Rich. And um, we are gonna hold questions just so you know to, for the virtual or for the for a virtual Q&A that'll be held live on the day of the event. So Rich. Great. Great, glad to be here and glad that you're all interested in tinnitus. This is a wonderful thing. So I'm going to present an overview of tinnitus activities treatment. So first of all, why is this person screaming? Well, you're all wrong and I'll get to this later on in the end. So I'm gonna introduce tinnitus activities treatment. We will review the different areas that patients are often affected by their tinnitus. Everybody's different. We'll provide some information to help you um, implement this in your practice. And we'll also talk about hearing aids and sound therapy, which is part of our tinnitus activities treatment. So this began um, back in the 1980s uh, when I was working in England and working with Ross Coles and many other people. And um, it was pretty clear that there wasn't a uh, organized strategy for helping tinnitus patients. Um, so uh, we started observing what was going on. There was one of the perhaps the first international meeting ever on tinnitus and um, we got ourselves involved in this. So one of the first things I did was publish an article um, where we interviewed patients uh, uh, we had them fill out a questionnaire about what problems they had and just make a list of the problems. And those included, as it turns out, thoughts and emotions, hearing difficulties, sleep, and concentration. This is just an open-ended questionnaire. So in our tinnitus activities treatment, it's really important to interact and connect with the patient. Um, and so the best way to do this for me so we don't forget things and to help the patients uh, understand the concepts is actually to use pictures. And so we uh, involve pictures. Uh, the patient is important in this. We don't really lecture the patient. We interact with them and socialize with them and find out where they're at. Um, so we identify the problems and then uh, we have some questionnaires we'll talk about. And then we have usually an introductory session where we start off with before we get into the details. So this is our tinnitus primary functions questionnaire, which has now been translated uh, worldwide. Um, and the examples here shown uh, are some uh, strategies where we find out if people are affected by sleep or if people are affected by concentration. And it turns out that not everybody is affected by all four. Most patients we see in the clinic are affected by hearing and are affected by emotions. Many are affected by sleep, some are not. Many are affected by concentration, some are not. So this is the introductory session. And we start off with, where do you want to start? So I don't want to think that I know everything about the patient, everything about tinnitus. I want to know where the patient is at. Where are they coming from? So we start off asking them, where do they want to start? Um, we would like to know, what do you think caused your tinnitus? People, some people don't know. For some people, it's very clear. Um, what was your life like? So we're all different. We all have different things going on in our lives. And I want to know about the individual. Where are they at? What's their life like even before they had their tinnitus? And of course, then, since your tinnitus began, how has it changed your life? What's different now for you? And how do you think we might be able to help? Sometimes I worry because a lot of patients want a magic pill and I don't have a magic pill. So I want to know, I want them to explain to me what their expectations are. How can I help? Where do you think I can help you? So that's a good place to start. So it's their session. 
Um, we want to include sessions that are relevant for them and review things. We want to answer, make sure we answer all the questions they have. There are activities we practice in the clinic before they go home with homework. And then when they come back for the next time, we go over their homework and answer any questions. So we usually have four or five individual sessions. Again, it depends on the individual patient. So any other questions that you might have? Um, anything that you'd like to try and accomplish? Uh, where are you at and how do you think we might be able to help you? So that's how we start this initial session with the patient. And now I'm going to go over the four different sessions that we have. Thoughts and emotions, hearing and communication, sleep and concentration. Uh, again, um, I'm just going to show you a sample of all the figures that we use in each of these sessions. And again, not everybody gets all of them. Uh, they're done one at a time and there's probably about oh, 40 or 50 pictures in each one of these sessions. And I'm just going to show you a handful just to give you an idea. They're all available online, which we'll discuss at the end. So we're going to talk about hearing, hearing loss and tinnitus. We'll talk about attention and behavior and how it connects with emotions and how you can change your reactions to your tinnitus and how we can help you. So we'll start off with something simple, even though some of them might understand this. We'll talk about the hearing system in general, and in particular, how the in inner ear sends information to the brain. And we emphasize that in this picture, where we talk about nerve activities. And so that nerve activity is going off to the brain and what I usually say to the patient is, it's like a flashlight going on and off. It's a little spike of electrical activity that's shot off to the brain. And um, it turns out that these uh, neurons that go up to the brain have activity on them, spontaneous activity, um, even when there's no sound. And your brain just ignores that, it hears silence. Um, when you have a hearing loss, you lose, lose some of those nerve fibers and on some of the nerve fibers the activity is decreased and you hear silence. When you have tinnitus, somewhere in the auditory system there's some hyperactivity and your brain interprets that nerve activity as a sound. So your brain is doing what it's supposed to do. Your brain is doing that nerve activity as a sound. And that can be reassuring to the patient that they're not making this up, they're not mentally ill, there's some activity on a nerve and their brain is interpreting that as a sound. That's what the brain is supposed to do. So uh, this is an example of how we had initiated uh, cognitive behavior therapy principles into our treatment. So the doorbell goes off. It's just a doorbell. Two weeks go by and the doorbell goes off and there's a fire outside. The next day the doorbell goes off and there's been a car accident outside your home. The next day the doorbell goes off and your tree has fallen on the neighbor's lot. Two weeks go by, doorbell goes off again, someone sends you flowers. The next day, the doorbell goes off. A friend has arrived. The next day, the doorbell goes off. Someone sent you a gift. It's a sound. It's not a good sound or a bad sound. It's a sound. And your experiences with that sound uh, have an impact on your interpretation of the sound and what it means for you. So it's a sound. It's not a good sound or it's a bad sound. It's a sound. There are a lot of things that can capture our attention. Things that are unusual, important, police siren going off, scary things, unexpected things. These things naturally capture our attention. We also easily ignore stimuli that are unimportant. 
So when we go into somebody else's house and they have a loud refrigerator in their kitchen, initially we can hear that loud refrigerator, but eventually it's just a refrigerator. Our brain automatically ignores it. If it's a lion walking in the room that's not supposed to be there, it's my pet lion, don't worry about it, you won't be able to ignore it. If there's a crowd out there and lots of activity and lots of noise and lots of stuff going on, you're going to pay attention to it and monitor it. So it's reasonable to pay attention to information that might be important for you. And if your brain interprets that the tinnitus is not important, maybe it can be ignored. Maybe you can put brain, the, the tinnitus into the background. If your brain determines, and if you determine, that the tinnitus is important, then it's going to be natural for your brain to pay attention to that. So, to change your reactions, can change the importance, your interpretation of the importance. You can change your emotional reaction to it. That can be accomplished sometimes by refocusing on other activities. And sometimes sound can actually be helpful. If you can reduce the contrast between the, the tinnitus and some background sound, it won't stand out as much. And that might be very helpful. So an example of that is a candle in a dark room. You have a candle in a dark room, it stands out like your tinnitus. If you open up a window and there's sunlight coming in, then the candle is not as prominent. And it may be for some people that having some background sound can also reduce the prominence of their tinnitus. It's a dog barking in the background. It's not your dog. You don't like dogs. You turn a fan on, you get yourself busy, and um, it turns out that eventually, when you're keeping active, both the fan and the dog can back into the background, move into the background for you. Hearing is really, really important. It's not just about hearing, it's about interacting with people and socializing. And uh, hearing and communication can be difficult when our tinnitus interferes with our hearing. So some patients tell me they have to hear over the tinnitus or through the tinnitus. And so there are lots of things that you can do to help improve your hearing ability and some things that we can help you with. And a lot of these follow what you would normally provide in an oral rehabilitation session to help people hear better. So we ask people to bring in their audiogram. If they haven't already got one, we can test it when they come in. But we want to go over their audiogram and uh, show them sounds that they can and cannot hear. Um, we talk about other factors that affect communication. It's not just about your own hearing ability but it's about background noise, your ability to see the patient, to see the talker, how familiar you are with the talker, how familiar you are with the discussion topic, and maybe just generally how stressed you are. So these are things, again, I'm just reviewing a few of the slides that are available in this tinnitus activities treatment. I'm not showing them all. So these are just uh, initiatives for different details that you're trying to find out where the patient is at, what kind of additional help they might need, and what directions you would go in to help them practice some of these things, like uh, reducing background noise in their own home environment or in their work environment. So these are general strategies that we're going to use to get them started. Hearing Loss affects communication. Some sounds you won't hear. We go over the high frequency vowel sounds, the um, music sounds, and uh, sounds that are too loud. So we go over this based on their own individual audiogram. Tinnitus is not damaging your hearing. Tinnitus can make it 
more difficult to hear sounds and also be distracting. And it may very well be that your tinnitus can mask some sounds. So it's really reasonable that tinnitus can affect your hearing. Hearing is really important and it's not just about hearing, it's about communicating, interacting with people and socializing. And hearing aids are a wonderful thing. Keep in mind we're all losing our hearing and we need to preserve that as best we can. And being able to communicate and socialize can be very critical to our lifestyle in general. Hearing aids can often help us, therefore, with our tinnitus, because we're interacting with people better. And also, hearing aids can actually amplify some low-level background sounds, which for some patients are very helpful in making their tinnitus less prominent. So again, part three now. So these are usually done in different sessions and the full lineup of all these are available elsewhere. So normal sleep patterns, we go over with the patient. We talk about how tinnitus can affect sleep. We talk about the activities that can facilitate sleep and get in the way of sleep and what to do when they wake up at night. So a variety of sleep patterns, um, one to another, we're all different. We have different uh, ways of sleeping, different sleep uh, activities that happen throughout the night. Um, I wake up usually once or twice during the night, um, but we're all different. Tinnitus usually doesn't wake people up, but maybe it does. But when you wake up at night in a quiet room and you hear that tinnitus going on, then maybe that's going to be an issue for you. Again, we're all affected by stress and emotions, the noise, temperature strategies, work schedules, um, time zone changes. So it's reasonable to have sleep as being one of the key factors that are affected by tinnitus. And we can do things in general to, for all of us to help sleep. And that includes um, physical activities, medications, coffee, smoking, alcohol, and tinnitus. So for example, avoid napping, getting exercise, um, keeping a clear separation between daytime and nighttime sleep activities, avoiding lots of exercise and food and drink right before bed, and going to bed when you're tired. So for tinnitus activities, maybe you can have a low level background sound. And sometimes we recommend people have these going on in their bedroom all the time. So they're not doing something to turn on some sound when they go into their bedroom to remind themselves they have tinnitus. Uh, or use some relaxation exercises on a routine basis before they're going to bed. So we're all different, uh, different strategies. You wake up at night, it's been recommended that if you can't fall back to sleep, you get up and try something new, uh, put on some background sound if there isn't background sound on. We're all different. Okay, uh, concentration activities. So things that can affect your concentration. So it's reasonable for tinnitus to affect concentration. You've got some sound that's not supposed to be there. And so we'll go over some strategies to help you get through that. So lots of things, including background noise, the temperature going on, whether we're hungry, whether we're anxious about something, all these things can affect our ability to focus, to read, to get our work done. That's quite reasonable. Well, if there's a sound in the background that's not supposed to be there, and you're thinking about the sound, and it's distracting, it's going to affect your ability to function. And so, again, this isn't true for a lot of people, depending upon our lifestyle and our work. Uh, requirements, but for a lot of people, the tinnitus can affect our ability to concentrate. So uh, first step is just to see how it does affect your concentration. How does it um, affect your work strategies when you're focusing on different simple tasks or complex tasks? And for a lot of people, they say when they're really focused on something um, that is demanding that their tinnitus is less of a problem for them. So it's different for different people. So if we can help you and if you can appreciate that your tinnitus is just a sound, it's not a good sound or a bad sound, it's a sound. 
And if your tinnitus is less important, it's going to make it easier for you to concentrate. You can eliminate other distractions. If you can stay focused, maybe that might mean adjusting your work habits. If you can decrease the prominence of tinnitus, which we'll talk about, and take control of your attention. So we have attention control exercises they have to practice in the clinic before they go home and also at home. Your attention is largely voluntary and you can learn to focus your attention under various conditions. Um, so we started off when we initiated this, we called it guided imagery. Um, so I always like to look at clouds and so there might be a cloud or we might look at pictures of clouds. And, or I would say, think of yourself, close your eyes and imagine yourself down on a beach in Jamaica and you can feel the breeze, you can hear the, the wind going through the palm trees. Life is pretty good. So uh, these are ways to divert your attention. And of course, now there's many different strategies to come to place, including meditation and mindfulness. Um, people can start new hobbies, including garden therapy and art therapy. Try something new. What can you do to make your tinnitus less important? And what can we do to help you? Okay. So, uh, so those are the four different areas. Again, not everybody gets all four, but we can focus on those uh, depending upon the individual needs. They go home, they have homework. Uh, I just showed you a, a few of the photographs available um, online. And now we'll talk about hearing aids. So for the hearing aids, this is a study we did on lots and lots of patients, and it turns out that a lot of people have, um, these are people that just have tinnitus, and a lot of them say they know they have a bit of a hearing loss, but tinnitus is their biggest problem, um, or they just haven't got hearing aids yet. Interestingly, 44% said they had normal hearing. And they did not. It was just that their tinnitus was the biggest problem for them. And their, of course, hearing loss in the aging population grows slowly. And as I tell patients sometimes, I think I hear as well as I did two months ago. And two months ago, I think I heard as well as I did two months before that. But we're all losing our hearing and losing our hearing gradually we don't always appreciate what we're missing. And hearing aids can make a big, big difference to that and make a big difference to hearing and communication and to tinnitus. So when people get hearing aids that have tinnitus, about half of them say it really hasn't changed their tinnitus very much. About 4.2% in this survey said that it actually made their tinnitus worse. And we'll talk about some ways to help them but almost half of the patients say when they get hearing aids, their tinnitus is actually better. And that's a great thing to share with patients. It can be better because it's improving their communication, it's improving their lifestyle in general, and improving interactions and socialization and reducing the stress in their life. Hearing aids also amplify background sound, they can provide some distraction and partial masking, which we'll talk about. So typically, with hearing aids, we assume background noise is undesirable, and therefore we use noise reduction circuits and directional microphones and try not to amplify low-level background sounds. And of course, with a hearing aid fitting, that's not the case. In many patients, everybody's different. We have to be aware of that but low-level everyday sounds can actually be desirable. So we can set the hearing aid up to amplify low-level background sounds in some patients. Uh, and again, these days you can control your hearing aids with your cell phone and you can have different settings for different kinds of uh, listening situations that might benefit the tinnitus patient depending upon their own background. So, um, you want to fit the uh, hearing aids to improve communication. That's really important to enjoy life, reduce stress. And again, think about uh, low-level noise being desirable in this case. 
And uh, as Jack Vernon always pointed out, you cannot determine that in a soundproof booth. You've got to walk the patient around and try different examples and life experiences. Hearing aids can be set um, so that you open the ear molds to allow background sounds in. You don't always want to provide directional microphones because that could reduce background sound. Uh, you can have higher gains at low levels that you normally would, not use noise reduction circuits, and extending broad frequency range to amplify background sounds. And of course, again, you can have different programs to amplify speech when needed in a quiet environment or in a noisy environment to use directional microphones, but you can also have uh, programs when the person is just working at home or just wants a tinnitus device or individual situations to maximize their tinnitus relief. Tinnitus can make, can be worsened by hearing aids, uh, turn down the gain, reduce the maximum output um, of the hearing aids. If that's the problem, uh, that's going to reduce the actual uh, dynamic range that they're exposed to. So over several months, uh, you would want to increase the gain slowly. Uh, it's also true that some patients are affected by tactile sensations around their neck and their, their jaw and can make their tinnitus worse. And it may be that some patients are uh, affected by having uh, ear molds or something worn around their ear. So be aware of that as a potential issue as well. Okay, so the last session is on sound therapy. So we talked about counseling and uh, hearing aids. So I went to Portland many years ago and Jack Vernon took me to this um, little park in downtown Portland and he said a patient took him to this park and said, this is the only place where I don't notice my tinnitus. And that gave Jack the idea to develop and to interact with a company to actually develop wearable tinnitus maskers. Um, so it can be very, very helpful for lots of people. There are several different neurophysiological models about how tinnitus changes the spontaneous activity in our auditory system. And having some background sound can actually reduce that. And so this is the slide that we show patients where their tinnitus is this activity going on uh, on their nerves and their brain is hearing that. When we play low level noise, that also uh, interacts with patients' uh, brains by presenting some random spontaneous activity. And if we combine that with the tinnitus, we see the periodic sound of the tinnitus is no longer prominent. And this is a bit of an oversimplification, but it can help some patients to show them a reason why sound therapy actually might be helpful. So this is the, uh, again, the, the slides we show patients. The tinnitus is prominent. It stands out there. If we add background sound shown in this total masking strategy, um, we can hide the tinnitus. And for some patients, they prefer to listen to a background sound than their tinnitus. It actually gives them some control, which is a good thing in itself. We recommended right from the very beginning that patients use partial masking. So this is the slide we use here. So they still hear their tinnitus, but our goal is to reduce the prominence and reduce the loudness. And this is a good thing if high level sounds are too loud. Um, the high level sounds might make their tinnitus worse. We also don't want to patients to be chasing after the noise and listening to the noise and listening to their tinnitus all day long, that's counterproductive. Jasterboff introduced the mixing point um, in retraining therapy, and we don't always go into this with the patients, but um, if some uh, have been heard about this mixing point, the mixing point was suggested that for low level sounds, um, that as you increase the level of the noise, it would, the effectiveness would be greater and greater until you reached a level just below the tinnitus. And then if you went above that and if you totally masked the tinnitus, the background sound would be ineffective. Well, I was concerned about that from the very beginning because it could make their tinnitus worse, it could make their hearing worse. Um, it turns out that the mixing point is too loud for most patients. It should not be the goal. We should be using the lowest level that is effective. 
Some prefer total masking, as I indicated, but the mixing point should not be the goal, in my opinion. There are lots of different sound therapy options now. Broadband noise, spectrum that can be modulated, envelopes that can be modulated, modulated tones, music, um, notch noise, notch sounds, lots of different options. Uh, this is a broadband or speech-shaped noise. Uh, we can measure the audiogram and set uh, some background sound to, depending upon their individual audiogram. We can modulate by the amplitude of tones. We can frequency modulate tones. We can use spa tones. Um, there is noise plus music that can be varied in a um, neuromonic strategy. Um, there are notch noise and notch music strategies. And my experience with this is that everybody's different. Every patient likes something different. For some patient, you will find a sound that's just right for them, and they say, oh, that's wonderful. My tinnitus is not as prominent anymore. This is fantastic. Then you will play the exact same sound to the next patient, and they will say, no, that's terrible. I don't want to listen to that. That's awful. Everybody's different, so you need to find the sound that best works for an individual patient. And again, they could have several sounds. They can actually do an at-home uh, trial period with trying several different sounds, one a day, and control the level and control the sound, turn it on and off from their cell phone. Um, some patients want monaural fittings, binaural fittings. In general, using a low-level sound is the best. You have to be careful if the noise makes the tinnitus worse. You might have to use a very low-level sound at first to provide that. And if they have hyperacusis, we won't go into hyperacusis activities treatment today, but uh, you have to be cautious about that and to treat that first. There are, of course, non-wearable maskers. Um, that can be done in the bedroom and your office at work. Uh, again, lots of different sounds available, um, music, uh, radios, uh, different options on your phone. So, um, Also, we have a sleep uh, option. There's uh, loudspeakers that can be inside your pillow. Um, and I always like to say that uh, the guy that invented this uh, back in the 60s thought that his University colleagues would want to rock and roll all night long, so he put a little loudspeaker in the pillow. Um, it turns out that it didn't work out that way, but his father had tinnitus, and his father said, let me try that. His father used it and said, hey, that helps with my tinnitus when I'm sleeping. So he moved on to that. So in conclusion, I provided a sort of a brief overview of the different functions of tinnitus primary functions activity, tinnitus primary functions activities that we use to help patients, um, including thoughts and emotions, hearing, sleep, and concentration. Everybody's different. Hearing aids are really important for all of us to hear better and communicate and socialize, and we need to control the maximum output of those hearing aids in our tinnitus patients. Sound therapies can be very, very helpful. Different sounds for different patients, low-level sounds are pref preferable, making the tinnitus less loud or less prominent. And for our hyperacusis activities treatment, we actually record the troublesome sounds that are available. So that's a summary. Um, all of these, uh, our full set of images are available at our university website. You can download for free. Um, and uh, we've described this in a few publications. Uh, we actually have a um, consumer handbook that we sometimes give to patients when they uh, purchase properties, uh, projects. The, um, my favorite book for clinicians, and there's a separate one for patients uh, using cognitive behavior therapy, was by Jane Henry and Peter Wilson in Australia, and that remains my favorite book on tinnitus. Okay, so why is he screaming? Well, when I go up to work, I usually like to work in a coffee shop, and this is uh, up north, and I'm in a coffee shop working at this table, and I look at the windows, and the coffee shop has had an artist paint in watercolors the screen. I thought, well, this is great. They did this just for me. I've been in this coffee shop several times. How cool is that? It turns out that this is why the person is screaming. He has spilled his coffee. 
So lots of reasons. Anyway, um, our uh, 28th annual tinnitus and hyperacusis conference will be in June of 2021. Um, and I hope you can make it. And if you are able to come, we will also have, as we do, a square dance in a round barn. Greetings from Iowa. Thanks, Rich, so much for sharing your, your uh, research and your clinical insights. As you mentioned, it, it can be very, very difficult to, to understand how to approach um, the tinnitus management when it's so, what works for people is, is highly variable. So thank you for sharing those insights. Um, just an, another reminder, we'll reserve Q&A for afterwards. We'll have an online uh, live event where we can uh, invite you to submit your questions online. And Dr. Tyler will be on along with our other speakers to answer your questions. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to welcome everybody to the, our final speaker. Uh, Dr. Lynn Henselman will be discussing how the Department of Defense for active service people, as well as the Department of Veteran Affairs for veterans are responding to this great need for assistance. Because when we think about it, let's look at the portion of our population. So if we have about 209 million adults in the US, 18 and over, and with over 18.2 million being veterans. We have an extraordinarily large group of people that are at high risk for hearing loss, as well as tinnitus. So with these numbers in mind and this population in mind, I'm pleased to turn over our final session over to Dr. Henselman. And again, reminder that we'll save our questions for after the, our virtual session, where our speakers will be available online to ask your questions um, in real time. So. Turning it over. Hi, Thanks. thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And and good morning, everyone. I'm sorry we're not able to actually meet in, uh, in New Orleans, but I'm glad we have this opportunity today. So today I'll be talking about some of my favorite topics, and that's uh, about veterans and service members. And just as a, a disclosure, I'm uh, no one else but myself is responsible for my uh, views presented in this presentation this morning. So uh, here's just a, an overview of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I, as you can see, am an employee of the Department of Defense Hearing Center of Excellence. Uh, so I'd like to provide a, a brief overview of that. Uh, I am currently a subject matter expert for the Center of Excellence. And up until December of 2018, I was its deputy director as a VA employee, Department of Veterans Affairs. So I just wanna talk a little bit about what the Hearing Center of Excellence does and what it does in terms of assisting uh, service members and, uh, and veterans that suffer from tinnitus. So we'll also talk a bit about the impact of tinnitus on service members and veterans, and then go into some of the efforts that both these departments have regarding uh, caring for our our service members and veterans who suffer from tinnitus. So before we get started, I would really like to just lay some groundwork and talk about some terms that I'll be using during the course of this presentation. Uh, the first is service member, and these often get confused, service members and veterans. So service member is someone in the uniformed services who is on active duty uh, where and, and is a beneficiary of the healthcare system for the Department of uh, Department of Defense, whereas veterans are individuals who have served in the military and have been discharged from active duty and are now under the care and under the benefits of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, so just a, a brief overview of the Hearing Center of Excellence. It was mandated in uh, fiscal year 2009, so it's been around for about 10 years now. And Congress uh, established the Hearing Center of Excellence with the Department of Defense to, to really look at the issues concerning hearing loss and auditory system injuries and to focus on 
on those through the continuum of care. So not only for prevention of hearing loss and auditory system injuries, but also diagnosis, mitigation, treatment, and rehabilitation. And Congress, um, insisted, which was very, very smart thing to do, that we collaborate, the Hearing Center of Excellence collaborate with a variety of organizations, especially the Department of Veterans Affairs. And organizations, not only Department of Veterans Affairs, but also industry, uh, academia, and even some of our, our international partners. So it's been a productive uh, format for getting things done. Uh, so here are the goals of the Hearing Center of Excellence. There's three major goals. The first is best practices. So the Hearing Center of Excellence is established to develop, disseminate, and help facilitate the implementation of evidence-based best practices. So based in research. We also have a, a research uh, mission. However, we are not a research facility. We're not a laboratory. We don't provide funding to research uh, to uh, researchers. We help with the coordination, encouragement, and facilitation of the conduct of research. So I'll get into that a little bit uh, later to explain that a little bit more. And delivery. Uh, we are very instrumental in helping with the, the VA with information they need to provide the benefits to veterans and also to help develop, again, these best practices. So we help in those the delivery of those kinds of services. And um, so what is a center of excellence? M many people, and I was one of them, frequently wondered, you know, what exactly is a center of excellence? What does that mean? Is that a think tank? What does it do? And there are many types of centers of excellence in the civilian sector and VA within the DOD, but the Hearing Center of Excellence is essentially a platform. So if you look at that red, the red bubble is the Hearing Center of Excellence, and it serves as a platform to bring subject matter experts and resources together where we can help identify uh, difficulties, gaps in research, gaps in, in clinical care, and we can bring these subject matter experts from a variety of organizations, not just the VA, but also industry and uh, some of the other federal organizations that have subject matter experts. And it's interesting, though, um, since there's no mandate that all these organizations have to collaborate with the Hearing Center of Excellence, our community is a very passionate and dedicated group. Um, and if you say, hey, I need help with you know, coming up with a clinical practice guideline for central auditory processing disorders, there'll be people at the table from organizations outside of the DOD and VA. So um, it's, it's a very collaborative organization. So why do we care about uh, tinnitus in service members and veterans? Well, they're at high risk. Um, the military environment is, uh, is full of hazardous noise levels. We have weapon systems and just equipment in general that provides noise that's, a, that's at a level that can cause damage to hearing and then cause tinnitus as tinnitus is often associated with, uh, with hearing loss. So in this slide, what you'll see is the prevalence of of two types of uh, disabilities, service-connected disabilities for veterans over time. And what we've seen since the 1990s is that the disability awards for hearing loss and tinnitus have continued to increase in our veterans. And the blue line shows that we are almost at about, right now with all veterans combined who are receiving disabilities, about 2 mil million of them receive some sort of service-connected benefit for, for tinnitus. So it is a concern, um, but we have to be very careful though, if we're looking at veterans and, and then looking at service members, these trends, are not necessarily what we're seeing in service members now. And we're beginning to look at that data because for the last 30 years, we've had very comprehensive and very uh, holistic hearing conservation programs, meaning programs that provide 
uh, many types of measures to prevent noise-induced hearing loss. And so a lot of our veterans now um, who are in the 60s, to 70 years of age were in uh, periods of service when hearing protection was not available. So many of them were exposed to this noise. But now we have these uh, hearing mandatory hearing conservation program in the Department of Defense. And uh, the services uh, are, as you can see in this, and, and again, another group of bubbles. Um, you can see that we provide hearing protection devices hearing testing at critical points in the service member's career to, to try to ensure that hearing loss isn't occurring, noise controls. But we know that in many of our weapon systems, as we increase their lethality, they become noisier. So we are while we are still seeing noise-induced hearing loss in the military and our active duty forces, we're not seeing it is what uh, to the extent that we were in um, in previous operations and wars. So um, we're looking at this, we're trying to understand it better, but that's, um, that's sort of a trend we're seeing. So tinnitus, um, I know many of you have attended the other uh, couple of sessions on tinnitus, and um, but some of you may not. So just to review what tinnitus is, it's the perception of sound, often referred to as ringing in the ears or the head, that doesn't have a source outside the body. And it's not a disease, it's a symptom. Uh, that something is wrong in the auditory system. And um, it's a typically for the population that we're talking about today associated with, with noise exposure and, and noise induced hearing loss. But there are several other non noise related causes such as medications, ear infections, vascular problems. So, um, so we have to be uh, sure in our, in our evaluations to, to make sure that we're diagnosing the, um, the exact reason for that tinnitus. And there are two types of tinnitus, objective, which is a very rare type. It's where the examiner could actually hear, not only the, the, the patient, but the examiner can actually hear that tinnitus. So it's outside the body essentially. And subjective tinnitus, which is typically what we see today um, and, and most of our patients. And it's, um, again, we don't have a way to diagnose um, the the presence of it or identify the presence of it, um, but um, that is typically the type that that we we find in our patients. So again, in the general population, about ten to fifteen percent of individuals experience tinnitus, and about one in five of that group have what's considered bothersome tinnitus. And if we look at the tinnitus pyramid. So this pyramid looks at that 10 to 15% of the general population. What we find is about 80% of, of them have tinnitus, but it's not particularly bothered by it. Whereas if we go higher in the pyramid, we see about 20% have bothersome tinnitus. And these individuals will typically seek out some sort of service uh, to learn more about their tinnitus. And, and those in the tippy top of this triangle have very debilitating tinnitus that has a great impact on their quality of life. So I wanna bring your attention to a report um, that Congress asked for back in the, back, it's been almost 20 years ago, but it was, but the results were published about, um, let's see, it was 14 years ago. And uh, Congress was very interested in understanding the uh, noise hazards in our service members and, and veterans. And, was very interested in learning about the relationship between noise exposure and hearing loss and tinnitus. And um, as a result, uh, the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Sciences, published this report that was put, put together by a series of, uh, of um, experts. And, and actually, Dr. Richard Tyler, who was one of the presenters in this series, was part of that panel. And what what the report showed about tinnitus, now it, it did a very nice review of the impact of tinnitus, but there was very little research and literature at that time about the specific impact of tinnitus on our service members and veterans. But in general, for the general population, this slide just summarizes the effects of, of what we've seen with tinnitus and that it can impair one's psychological well-being, emotional health, 
sleep, uh, a very important thing for our service members. We're finding more and more about um, how sleep deprivation in our service members can impact their performance, impaired concentration, and even depression. There can also be uh, in increase in fear, frustration, anger, irritability, and even an increase in, in suicide risk. So when we look at um, just how tinnitus impacts the general population, we can make some assumptions about how it might impact our service members and our member and our and our veterans. So these are just some potential impacts, medical readiness. So essentially that includes the service members' fitness to fight, um, operational performance, their performance in training and in combat. Their, the safety of their themselves and their unit and the quality of life. Um, our veterans, again, quality of life is most likely uh, can be impacted by tinnitus. Uh, it may also affect them in their civilian jobs and also their safety. So uh, I just want to show a little bit in, in this slide some of the, the noise environments that our service members work in. The one on the very left is a, uh, a service member who looks like she's on a, an aircraft carrier and she's providing maintenance on a jet. She's wearing hearing protection, a cranial device that uh, I think that what I've heard is that the deck of a aircraft carrier is, is the noisiest place in the world. We also have in the middle picture a um, uh, an artillery team, um, which those blasts are just am amazingly loud, where you can actually see the concussive uh, effects. And then I just like to pay tribute to our veterans. This is a World War II veteran, one of my favorite actually, who served uh, in the Army Air Corps as a, and he was a pr pr prisoner of war, shot down in a B-17, and. Um, and he suffered from hearing loss and tinnitus throughout his life. And he also suffered with raising me because that's my father. Um, okay, so our service members. All right, we know that there's a lot of noise out in the environment. Um, and we have learned a lot in the last 20 years since the recent conflicts about our service members being even at greater risk. We even have, we have, uh, incredible blast exposures. We, again, as I mentioned earlier, we have weapon systems that are even more lethal and therefore they're more, they're noisier. Um, and we also are beginning to understand about the impact of traumatic brain injury and the impact of PTSD um, and their association with tinnitus. So, um, uh, I, I just pulled some numbers of Dr. Royce Clifford, who's out of the VA in uh, in San Diego, and she uh, published an article recently that talked about uh, for mild TBI patients with who are di diagnosed with mild TBI in the VA system, that um, that about 76% of them have a diagnosis also or, or have tinnitus that's associated with it, and for those with PTSD, about 33% of veterans uh, in the VA system have report, report tinnitus. So we also need to be concerned about some of these um, more recent and, and more traumatic uh, sounds and acoustics that are occurring. But while we're busy still trying to, to, to find a cure for tinnitus, which we haven't done yet, and you've probably heard from the other speakers some uh, promising uh, research. We in the VA, or I used to be in the VA, but the VA has um, has uh, a, a very prominent scientist named Dr. Jim Henry, who is at the National Center for Rehabilitative Auditory Research at the Portland, Oregon VA. And he has spent about the last 20 years developing a best practice uh, called progressive tinnitus management for veterans. And it is a way to help, again, we have no cure, but there is the possibility that we can help veterans and service members to manage their reactions to tinnitus so that it doesn't impact their life. 
Um, and so this is an evidence-based practice and uh, it is an interdisciplinary approach, meaning that we work with audiologists, otolaryngologists, and even mental health providers. It's a five-step program where there are different levels of care and patients receive only what they need. So it's been implemented now in, in not only VA, but also in the Department of Defense. So uh, we know tinnitus is usually chronic and it's permanent, but there is hope, there is a way to help manage one's reactions to tinnitus through this PTM. And PTM really focuses on providing education so that our patients can become self-sufficient. We can provide them with skills to provide self-sufficiency to manage their reactions. And I just want to check my time. Um, and so again, um, it is not a treatment. It's it's a a way of of managing reactions. And this is essentially the uh, the levels of care, and all the way from a referral. Um, all the way up to individualized care. So we're very involved in uh, providing education, as you can see through this entire entire time. And it's been developed into a best practice um, that is used by, by VA and DOD. So it's a published evidence-based practice. And um, so we now have this. We wanted to understand better both DOD and VA. Are we actually getting those services to patients? And NCRER, Dr. Dr. Henry, and the Hearing Center of Excellence actually looked at um, uh, how we're getting the service to to our patients and to our providers. And we find out that we found out that we had some work to do. So we developed a working group uh, that was founded by NCRER, the Hearing Center of Excellence, and Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. And we now have many other subject matter experts from around DOD and VA. And these are the goals of that, that uh, working group, the tinnitus working group, VA DOD tinnitus working group. And essentially we're a group of people that are putting um, knowledge products, developing knowledge products or tools for our, our providers so that they can provide the care for our service members and veterans. Um, not only in PTM, but also the assessment that goes on for tinnitus. So, and we also advocate, we're the advocates for our providers and for our patients. Um, I just wanna uh, talk a little bit about a study that's being conducted by Dr. Jim Henry again. Um, and this is a recommendation, this study was a recommendation that came out of that 2006 IOM report. and. Uh, he recently looked at specifically the impact of tinnitus on service members. So that's something that we uh, we had a gap in our evidence to try to understand that. So this is a study he published in 2019 with his team. And bottom line is what he found by looking at a sample from his cohort, and I'm sure he'll be updating this as he, as he goes along with this study, is that the presence of tinnitus can have effects on job performance, which may be directly or indirectly caused by the effects of tinnitus on concentration, anxiety, depression, and sleep. So um, this just brings home the point that it is very important that we provide our service members and veterans with access to uh, evidence-based best practices that will help them um, with their tinnitus. So with that, one of the tools that we have developed in the Hearing Center of Excellence to help research and to help understand tinnitus is we now have the Joint Hearing Loss and Auditory System Injury Registry. Congress required that we build this. And this really is, um, a, a record, a longitudinal record, it provides a longitudinal record, record of digitized information that's queryable. Um, so scientists love this, clinicians love this, and we can understand what happens to a service member with their auditory uh, and vestibular, their balance health throughout their career. 
So we can see it and we can use this information as clinicians, but we can also use this information as researchers. And this will be the, is the foundation for helping us to develop those best practices. So with that, in summary, um, I want to thank you again for this opportunity to present um, and talk about our real high-risk population, our service members and our veterans. They are at risk for tinnitus, and um, so hopefully uh, you have gained an appreciation for that. And also, um, hopefully, I've, I've given you some insight into some of the, uh, the things that the Hearing Center of Excellence, Department of Defense, and the Department of Veterans Affairs are doing to help our service members and veterans. And um, and I also provided uh, in some of the backup slides, some information for you uh, about some of the specific research that's going on where the Hearing Center helps facilitate. So that'll give you also some insight into, into some of the things that we're hoping will, will, um, will be successful. So with that, um, I will open this up to Kelly. Lynn, I want to take this opportunity to thank you and thank you for sharing uh, reasons to hope by sharing some of the examples and research that are ongoing in search of ways to not only be able to treat and manage tinnitus, but perhaps some data to find a cure. I want to take this opportunity also just to thank all of our speakers in this in this research symposium. On behalf of the Hearing Loss Association of America, our members, my fellow board trustees, as well as myself. I know you have busy schedules and um, it's unfortunate we weren't able to, to uh, meet in person in New Orleans, but I do want to give our, our listeners the chance to speak with you directly and, and share any questions they have. So I invite our, our listeners to take a break and return and we'll have a question and answer period with our scientists available to you in, in real time. Thank you. Thank you to all the members and to the HLA. Thank you. <laughs>